welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Okay, so welcome to all of you all. And today we are in for some pearl talk. With us is a very talented designer from Hamburg and London, Melanie, who is known for designing unique, modern, and contemporary pearl jewelry. And today, Melanie is going to be talking to us about her collaboration with a renowned Japanese brand known as Tasaki, and the collaboration name is known as M G Tasaki. So we welcome you once again, and we are looking forward to seeing your spectacular jewelry. Thank you. So let's hear by knowing how did it all begin. Yes. So um, I had I after finishing my studies at the Royal College of Arts in two thousand and seven, I was already interested in pearls, but. I wasn't sure if that was uh, the direction I wanted to take, so I was offered a job as a freelance designer. But I was carrying on producing my own work on the weekends and in the afternoons. Uh, around 2010, I was very lucky because my pieces were picked up by Dover Street Market in London, which is a very influential shop. And I remember, I think it must have been beginning of 2000. 10, a bit later maybe, after the collection has had been in the shop for two, three months, not that long, I received an email by someone from Tasaki uh, inviting me to come over to Japan. And they didn't really specify the reason, but of course, a big company offers you a, a, a one-week trip to, to Japan, of course you say yes. So I was invited in June to spend a whole week. I knew I was going to visit their, sh uh, their shop, their flagship store in Ginza in Tokyo. I was also invited to co go to Kobe, where their production building is. And I also had a one day trip to Nagasaki, which is where one of their pearl farms is. So I knew it was gonna be a very full week and I was very, very excited. It was my first time in Japan. Mm -hmm. And what happened during that week, I was just totally blown away. Uh, apparently, and had realized that um, I was someone who was who had a strong interest in pearls, but I was also trying to find a new way to create contemporary pearl jewelry. And at the end of that one week trip, I was still flying on cloud nine, obviously, from all the information and they were so open and they explained to me how they work and what they want to do in the future. They put a folder in front of me, and that folder had the description of a joint brand called MG Tasaki. MG, obviously, for Melanie Georgia Coppolis, since I appreciate it's a little bit long uh, for any audience worldwide. And I just said yes. I, it was unbelievable. So they offered me a long-term plan to create a joint brand with my initials, with their name. I designed for them, and they produce, and they market all the collections. And since then, I am proud to say that it's been an ongoing collaboration, which is renewed every three years. And I design on average five to six collections a year. And they're now being sold in all the Tasaki stores, as well as in Farfetch, and also in certain selected stores in the States. So I am very, very proud of that. Wow, so that really calls for a big round of applause. It all happened very mystically, right? He just invited you without sharing any information. What's the purpose of your visit to Japan? And that's how, and at the end of the trip, they just uh, offer a paper to you, which has all the clauses and the entire collaboration, which they had spoken about. Yes, I think they wanted to get to know me first. And I understand because I think it was, it was a very bold move, I think for any brand to offer such an incredible opportunity to a young designer. I was around 30 years old at the time. And although I had shown a strong interest in pearls through the collection that I had already uh, designed and made, I think they simply wanted to be sure because before they offer, offered any kind of opportunity or contract so I was pleasantly surprised. Yes, so it's indeed a wonderful acknowledgement of your talent. And talking about your talent, let's have a look at some of your incredible jewels so from the MG Pasaki collaboration. Yes. So as I've told you before, um, we've basically designed or I've designed, they've produced more than 30 collections over the years 
we've sold over 5,000 pieces. And the idea for MG Tasaki is to have very contemporary, bold pearl jewelry design. So the pearls, we can use freshwater, akoya, any kinds of pearls. They obviously make everything to um, an extreme degree of perfection. I can't describe it any other way. And we thought that the initial collection should be the sliced collection, which I had already designed for my own brand, but then I decided to sell the designs to them. So we started from the beginning. So actually I have the original piece that I had made from my degree show, which then became the first piece that I that I gave to MG Tasaki. And this is part of the slide series. So you can see the pearls are slowly cut to reveal the center of the pearl. And then it goes all the way around and then it ends up with the whole pearl. So I think that comes from my background as a sculptor, as a having done sculpture studies where I really want to see what the pearl is like as a material. So in order to do that, I have to sculpt it, I have to facet it, to sand it, to cut it. And we um, produced a few collections with that idea in mind after this one. And one of those is the drilled collection. So this is actually a peacock freshwater pearl, which has been drilled and treated so many times that it becomes hollow. And I'm actually wearing the earrings in that collection. Interesting. And I'm like, I like the idea that it doesn't look like a pearl anymore because I found over time, there's especially young people, they, they, they don't like the idea of wearing pearls, any kind of pearls. And I think when you create something that doesn't look like a pearl anymore, but still is on close inspection, then it's something that intrigues them. And I think that attracts them to, to the jewelry. And then it happens to also be a pearl. And that's a direction I've definitely um, taken into account over the years in designing. Another important collection was this piece, which is part of the Arlequin collection. It's a very, very simple design where the pearl is half covered with a sheet of gold. Yes. So the one half is the pearl and the other half is the sheet of gold. And then this is for everyday wear because we should have pearl jewelry for special occasions, but we should also have pearl jewelry for every day and we should just feel comfortable wearing it and not think about it to the point that it just becomes part of us. And I think it's important to work in both of those directions because different women will wear different kinds of jewelry for different occasions. So for me, it has always been important to, to cater to a younger audience because if you get them, then they'll, they'll stay with you. And as they grow older, they'll carry on investing in more important pieces. Absolutely. Another collection which I actually put on my Instagram account today is this, which is one of my favorite pieces ever, because this is a piece that was initially created with the help of a palladium board. It's from the Shell collection and it has a row of ascending freshwater pearls and then palladium on the outside. And it's a bracelet, so you're meant to wear it from the side. Yeah. You know, and it just sits perfectly. Right, so I believe that all the pearls are towards the inside, right? Not towards the outside. And that's exactly. Also that's, again, you know, you've thought something out of the box. It's, uh, I think it's nice to have pearls touching your skin because Lovely. they take on the temperature, so eventually they warm up. And okay. also in terms of protection, if you are writing or you're resting your hand on right. that tape, wow. they will be protected by the wire. And I really like that the opening is on the side rather than at the top. Um, so the sliced collection was obviously very important and it still is because people still talk about it and that's the best compliment I think I could ever have. Mm -hmm. So when Sasaki celebrated their 60 years anniversary in 2014, they asked me to revisit that collection and make a special edition of pieces. And one of those pieces was this necklace, I which has it. been sliced just a small section yes. here and we've put gold sheets. You see how they reflect the light. And it's just a tiny, I mean, we've sliced maybe six, seven pearls right here, but it's just enough to create, I think, a little something that makes it look different, but also extremely luxurious. And I really enjoyed designing this sort of upgrade of the slice collection. 
And in that same year, we also launched this group of pieces, which again, I really, really love. This is called the Stellar Collection. So they're diamond shapes because of course diamonds and pearls, they're so connected in the world of fine jewelry. And the diamond has six facets, six gold facets. Each facet represents one of the decades of Tasaki. And in the center, we've trapped an Akoya pearl, which is obviously a Japanese pearl. It's, these are the Tasaki grows in their farms. And the pearl is not drilled at all. So it's just captured in the middle by those sheets of gold. And I thought it was interesting to put those elements of the Tasaki DNA, which is a pearl and gold, and of course diamonds, without putting the diamonds, but just capture them in one piece of jewelry. How does the idea to think out of the box and to break the whole, you know, like the whole pattern of old fashion style of wearing pearls? Because in the olden days, we've seen people wearing either strings of pearls or maybe earrings of pearls or maybe bracelets or rings of pearls. But you have completely thought out of the box. So let's hear about the inspiration and the journey of thinking out of the box. Well, I think first of all, I, although I had a grandmother who wore pearls every day, she had her string of pearls and she always said, if I don't have this on, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm naked. So I had that idea in my mind. But otherwise, I don't think I was scared of pearls the way some jewelers are at the mm -hmm. beginning my life as a designer so I never had these preconceived ideas of what pearly pearl jewelry is what it means and therefore when I started cutting them I wasn't I wasn't really scared of doing it because I didn't think of them as this incredible gem that is on all the royal jewelry and that people wear on certain occasions so I think I was very free in that sense and then over I'm, of course, I've realized all these things. I've read more. I'm constantly researching about, about sort of antique pearls and how they were used in the past and, you know, the biggest ones, the most expensive ones, all of that. Mm -hmm. But now I've decided to adopt the mindset of um, a generation who wants to produce something different. There's no point repeating the past. It's been done. And there's perfectly uh, there's a perfectly good amount of traditional pearl jewelry out there which has been done very well by the companies who do it mm -hmm. but i feel almost like it's my my calling you know it feels very natural to me to think of pearl jewelry in a different way I, and it's not forced it just comes out of personal interest because i want to surprise myself but I also want to surprise people and I've had over the years um, a good luck to hear from a lot of people who said to me I, I never thought of wearing pearl jewelry but when I saw your jewelry I really wanted to wear it and I'm not trying to sell them pearl jewelry I'm just trying to sell them or entice them with jewelry that has pearls and I think that's where the difference is because they buy the design Right. And design happens to have pearls. That's yeah. a wonderful. In your statement, you mentioned that you cut the pearls, you know, you slice the pearls. Did you actually experiment with all the designs that you have created about slicing them, them and about the entire mechanism uh, as to how the final product will look? And then did you forward it to the Saki? Yes. I am a very I have a very hands-on approach. Generally, I like to try things myself. I yeah. love to work on prototypes. I love to touch the material. And I'm always intrigued by people who are shocked when I say to them that, yes, I cut pearls in two. Because most of all other gemstones, we've cut them. We facet them. We take diamonds out of the earth, and we don't find them beautiful enough. And we start to put facets on them, and we decide what the shape will be. Mm -hmm. and we make them more beautiful. So why can't we do that to pearls? Because they are also gemstones. I think this is the idea, this idea of beauty and, our, and the human intervention connected to it that still intrigues me. Because when I cut a pearl, of course it's out of curiosity, but I'm thinking, well, it's a gem. Can I make it look more beautiful or can I integrated and in the design where the cutting makes sense and especially with those cut pieces i think that really that really makes sense 
that when you add a facet to a pearl, then it absorbs the light differently. Because of course the diamonds sparkle because they have all the facets. Mm -hmm. And I it's so surprising that lately there is an increase in uncut diamonds. People yes. are starting to appreciate rough diamonds now, or old mine diamonds, which had more, which had less facets because they didn't want to waste so much of the material. So I like how our perception of beauty and value is changing over time. And I think as jewelers, we need to respond to that and to be aware of that and to adapt accordingly. I want to know that what were the challenges and the perks that you received working as an independent designer with such a big, renowned jewelry house? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's challenges, but um, every challenge is a good thing because you learn things about yourself, you improve, you adapt, and ultimately, if you have... It's not an obstacle, but if you have a difficulty in your way, you find a way to overcome it. I mean, culturally already working with a Japanese brand, it's just a totally different um, environment than working with a European brand or an American brand. Mm -hmm. And I think the language, of course, they speak English. I don't speak Japanese. So you, we found a common language and English is not my first language either. So again, Greek person speaking English, Japanese people speaking English, and we kind of meet in the middle. Um, then the reality, my reality of being an independent designer with not that much experience and working with a mega company with over a thousand employees, every department, wow. be it the design department, the marketing department, the production department, they have hundreds of people working for them. So. As an independent designer, I'm used to doing a bit of everything by myself, you know, a bit of the website, all the email communication, the photos, and then slowly, as, uh, as I grew, I started to outsource and delegate. But it's, I still work with a very, very, very small team. And the reality of communicating with a large company where you're not just talking to one person, you need to talk to 10 different people, and they don't always communicate because they are in different buildings or they work in different teams and they communicate in a different way. And I think that's fascinating. I mean, ultimately, I feel like I was, I'm still working on the two opposite spectrums of the jewelry industry. So I work with a very large brand and then I work as an independent designer. And actually, over the years, I feel there's been a lot of cross-pollination. I've been able to do things in my own work because I am aware of how a bigger brand operates and vice versa. I am aware of how a website works, for example, or how, certain, how you need to have certain photos for editors, you know, white background, all these little details because I work directly with editors. I don't have a department doing it for me. So I'm very hands-on and I've tried to be hands-on with the work that I do for Tasaki. Amazing. But also understand when I have to take a step back and let that team do what they know how to do best. So that's also been a learning curve of me saying, no, I shouldn't talk anymore. I should just stop and listen now. Right. So, yes, of course, there are tons of words of compliments. Yes, you are a rock star. Bravo. You are so inspirational. And trust me, when I see your work as an independent designer of your own collection and, and also of MG Tasaki, I always get so amazed as to how beautifully you differentiated both the collection. And after you. hearing your story, how you single-handedly worked around with a team of thousand. I think, trust me, you know, that really calls a hats off to you. You are so inspiring to all of us that once you have your goal and your vision and your intentions are absolutely clear to work from your heart, I think you can achieve everything. You are like a role model to all of us right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this is what makes it interesting also. And the yes. fact that I, I try to surprise myself, but also people who watch what I do is because otherwise it becomes a bit stale, a bit boring. Yes. You know, if you keep repeating the same thing, you don't really grow as a designer. So that's why I'm always, I'm, I'm more of a yes person uh, to any, any obstacles or any difficulties or any challenges you can give me. Lovely. And now let's proceed and see some more of your MG Tasaki collection. Yes. So I don't have a huge collection here, but I have a few pieces and I wanted to show you especially this one. This is from the stretched collection. 
So uh, let me see, hold on. I have to practice a little bit more with this. So these are pearls where the gold chain looks like it's been stretched. I mean, all these pieces are on the Tasaki website. So if you just Google the name, you'll find it. And what I like is the minimalism of this collection. So you don't have any things, anything that you don't need. You just need the chain and the pearl, nothing else. And the chain is used to hold the pearl. No extra prongs, nothing. And this particular necklace I really love because it's so versatile. You can wear it as a double pendant. You can wear it open. And you can also do this, which I should be doing on my neck. I'm sorry, but I'm just going to do it. No, it's absolutely fine. You can just drape them through and wear it as a second pendant. Lovely. Can we have a closer look at how beautifully the chain has been attached to the pearl, please? Of course. I can't do it much justice with my phone camera, but I'll try and show you here. Right. See? Yeah. But you can see all those details on the Tasaki website. And on, actually, I think this one is on Farfetch too. Um, Another collection we did lately was called Faceted, and I really love this one for a variety of reasons. So this is a Mabe pearl, which is also called a blister pearl. These pearls are growing on the shell, but they never get detached, so you always have half a sphere, and then you need to cut it down and then put it back to it. So it's a bit complicated. These are very special in Japan. They have a silvery color, silvery purpley color. And this collection, it's faceted like a diamond again. You can see I have a bit of an obsession. Yes. <laughs> but it's um, set on Sakura gold, which is the trademark gold that Tasaki has developed. It's a, it's a pink gold, but it's a bit softer than the normal pink gold. And I really like this because of the unique color combination. And this is Something that they suggested to me to work with Mabe pearls because I've never worked with them before and they're not that easy to find. And again, it was part of growing, not just using the same pearls all the time. I think for many people, pearls are round and white. Yes. But there are so many other kinds of pearls and so many colors also. Yes, and I think this is what is also exciting for me as part of this collaboration is as we go as we keep on making collections, we sort of expand right. the, on the pearls that we use and the gemstones. Mm -hmm. So if we keep on evolving, we're not going to keep on using the same pearls. And I think it's interesting for people to, to discover also um, that the pearl world is so diverse and so big. And hopefully through MG Tasaki, they will understand the differences between all the different kinds of pearls and then the sizes and the colors and they will hopefully appreciate that um, you can have a pearl pendant but it doesn't have to look like the traditional white pearl pendant so I think this is that little element of magic that happens when someone says this is pearl jewelry but at the same time it's not pearl jewelry I think this oh is what God. I really like about it yeah, and I have a dear friend Peggy who's joined us from New York, and uh, she's also a great admirer of Pearl. So Peggy, thanks for waking up so early and uh, and joining us, you know, in this whole conversation. <laughs> I have so much love for Peggy. Yes, yes, she's absolutely adorable. Let's see some more collection that you have for us. Yes, so I wanted to show you also this one. I mean, the last few collections we started using diamonds. Uh, yes because it's something we didn't do before and i think there was interest from clients to use a little like a little pave or a little accent of diamonds and this is part of the pyramid collection i love this yes so as you can see the the titles are very <laughs> descriptive of the collection yes uh, so these are like two pyramids of six millimeter pearls put on top of each other. And then in the center, in the middle, there is a pave of white mele diamonds. And I like that we tried with this collection. There's two big rings also, but unfortunately I don't have them here. I tried to create volume with this, with the pearls, because one of the um, directions I think that is important to consider with pearls is it's fashion appeal because we see a lot of pearls on the catwalk and of course they are 99% plastic pearls. So we see brands like Burberry, I don't know, Christopher Kane, Alexander McQueen a lot. 
And they use pearls in such an abundant way on the clothes, on some big accessories. And I think there is a direction to take within fine jewelry, which is taking pearls and pushing them to the limit of their fashionability, but still having the real thing, having gold, having diamonds, yes. creating a piece that is fashionable, yet timeless, and having the balance between the two. There is, there is um, I think that goes throughout my work, my personal work also, but the direction as a sculpture, so looking at the pearl as a material, but also looking at the pearl as a fashion accessory, because more and more we see younger girls going to high street shops and buying, you know, big plastic fake pearls, which I think is absolutely fantastic because those little girls, they're going to grow up when they're 20, 25, then they're going to get one or two pieces for a graduation, a birthday. And when they start to be 30, 35, and they start earning a bit of money, they will then come to us and they will invest in the real thing. Right. So yeah. there have been many questions asking, where can they purchase these beautiful jewels from? So uh, you can see all the collections in detail on the Tasaki website. There is a very big selection on Farfetch. And you can also directly uh, message me and I will tell you where to get them. You can get them through us or you can just buy them, of course, at the shops, but then all the shops are closed now. I mentioned that you work with gold, you work with diamonds and pearls, of course. So do you also work with other gemstones? Yes, we did. I have photographs. We did uh, do a collection with Baroque pearls. And also that was a, a one-off where we used tourmalines and peridots. And I have some photographs of it here. And it's very, very well received. Right. You can see here, sorry, it's the photos. There you go. And I think that's what's great when you have an ongoing collaboration with big brands, you basically expand. So I feel that in the future, now lately we started using diamonds, and in the future we will like expand on more gemstones and different kinds of pearls. Which is your favorite collection since you've worked with the Saki for almost like five to six years? No, more than that, 10 years. Yeah, it's almost 10 years. I think we should, we should plan a big party for the 10 years, but I think we're, we're getting very close to that. I think one of my favorite pieces is this one, which I wear almost every day. It's a quarter of a pearl. So it's, been, it's a pearl that's been cut in four pieces. And then this is an earring, and then it's encased in gold. Oh, interesting. Um, it's so small. I think it's probably the smallest piece we've ever made, but it's so wearable. And I personally couldn't find anyone to do this in the, in the quality that they've made this in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the, they've taken it and they've cut it and then they've set it. And I mean, you can't see the detail, but the corners are absolutely perfect. So this is, this is, called, this is part of the Wedge collection. And this is definitely one of my favorite collections mm -hmm. because of the amount of detail and general perfection that it's been made right. with. Right. Yeah. So talking about Wedge collection, when I was having a look at the images, I was absolutely astounded. How did they manage to cut a small little quarter of the pearl? I mean, technically, how challenging it may have been. And my question to you is that, is there something known as pearl wastage while cutting, while slicing? Is there a fear of wastage of pearls? So they don't even tell me how they do it exactly because they want this to be kept a very tight secret because it's part of the okay. of the brand. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, however, I can tell you that um, Tasaki is very conscious about the environment and sustainability. Mm -hmm. And um, when everything that is considered a waste, they will take it and then they will sell it on to other industries to be used. And that applies to their pearls also from their farms. So they really, really take care of that. But I think one of the things that I admire most about Tasaki is the fact that the pieces don't even look like they're made by someone. They are so perfect. Wow. So I have no idea what that machine they use is for cutting is, but it is it's, it's producing perfection simply how lovely so mm -hmm. on a lighter note if i would like to go and visit the sake and see go to the pearl farm and also see how the entire production mm -hmm. is done 
is there a sort of channel or a source where i can say listen hey i want to see the whole production and i also want to see how your pearls are farmed and stuff like that just on a lighter note <laughs> i will put you in touch i don't think they do um, tourist tours i don't think so i think they reserve it to press to journalists to industry related people right. but i can i can definitely organize that for you no problem <laughs> i'll i'll give you the right phone number to call <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And tell us, it what are you designing next for MG Pasaki? So we launched a collection at the beginning of the year, and actually, I have one of the pieces here. Uh, it's called Slash. It's already on the website, and it's already being sold in stores. Uh, the ones that are open. Um, we've developed a special cut of diamonds. So it's um, it's. signifying the slash that we use for the slicing of the diamonds which is also part of the logo and it's the first time we've done a small collection without any pearls which was a surprise to Tasaki as well as myself because exactly the way i do this they send me a direction that's based on price point on sales and then i basically have an open i can do whatever i want so depending on you know what i'm what vibrations i'm getting in my brain from the surrounding fashion and design world i will come up with a few different directions which will be presented in an illustrator format in terms of design and i will give them an option of about 20 pieces per collection and they will choose 5 6 10 pieces and they will start production so i really like to give them a lot of choice and this particular collection started as something else and often what happens is when i go to japan so the way it happens is a few months before i'm supposed to go to japan they will send me this idea of what they would like and then i will send back a couple of months later uh, a big folder by, by email with a lot of designs they will choose and by the time i go to japan and we start having the production meetings they will have already developed some prototypes they will start having an idea of prices and we will talk about the details which are i need to see the prototypes and then we'll discuss you know what size will the jump ring be will it be 0.5 or will it be 0.4 mm which actually makes a big difference uh, ultimately it sounds a little bit funny but like this is what fine jewelry is and this collection slash started as something very different and in the end we got to the point after the day the two days of meetings where i said but we don't really need pearls for this and they were like yeah that's true but then the brand is about pearls and i'm like yeah but maybe we can do a collection without pearls we'll do just do one with diamonds so we've done uh this version with diamonds but also with other colors of stones mm -hmm. and it's very fresh it's very different and i almost like that we've reached to the edge of the mg tasaki brand and then the next collections will sort of go back to the pearls but i like that we've we try to expand the right. narrative of what mg tasaki can do right peggy has a thing that melanie's namesake collection nekre is is my g i'm guessing that's that's one of her favorite collection is that what yes, you yes 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 mm. thank you peggy hi so do you have any questions or or is there any specific collection that you would like melanie to show us please let us know and uh, some words of inspiration to all of us single handedly climbed mm. up a great ladder of success based on your passion based on your hard work so what words of advice would you share to all of us okay i would say um because i happen to be teaching also at central st martins so i i love to be close to people who are starting their journey now in jewelry and also see what their approach is because i'm not old old but i like to see what what is happening now in jewelry in the level of students and i always say to people just try and find your voice and that's going to take a while because it doesn't happen from day one you need to work and at the same time stay stay open to what's happening around you but i think for me ultimately what matters is um when you see a piece you you know who made it so you you see a personality and energy you feel that someone has put 150% in it mm -hmm. and ultimately if you 
if you find what you love and you do what you love, the name may come, may not come, and what is having a name anyway? But it's, I don't think people do this to, to be famous. Right. This is not part, this is not the, the goal of this. The it's goal not. is to make a living from it mm -hmm. and to also be happy because it's a passion ultimately. I think for many jewelers I've spoken to over the years, it's really a labor of love and it keeps on giving, but you also need to give a lot of yourself into it. So I think just love what you do, but I think that applies to all, all sort of walks of life and businesses anyway. Right. There was one interesting statement uh, by someone. You, what type of research has to be done if there is challenging design or problem solving design? Well, it depends on the case, but I would say what I've realized over time is that a problem is almost like an opportunity. It's such a cliche, but if I, for example, I have a certain idea that I really like, Tasaki may not like it so much or they think it's not appropriate for the clients, I will try and rephrase what I say verbally or I will try to explain the concept behind it because sometimes you can see something, you're like, yeah, I like it, mm -hmm, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. But if you understand the thinking behind it, mm -hmm. I think that helps resonate with the, with the piece more. And I think this is why it's so important with the bigger brands because it's obviously a lot of people involved. Yes. That they explain the thinking behind the collection. You know, they, they, you can see the connection between the brand, the designer, the heritage of the brand. And this is where the marketing comes in. I don't think you can get away with just saying, oh, this is pretty. Here it is. You know, clients ask more questions now. And I think if I truly, if I truly believe in the design, I will try as much as I can to explain it and to say, but this is right now, this is right for now, this is right for your client, this is right for this reason and that reason. And if still they don't see it, then that's fine. Maybe I was wrong. You know, I'm not right about everything anyway. So um, I would say for any problem, just do your best to break it down and re-put it together in a different way that maybe gives a new approach to it. Yeah. Right. That's so beautifully said. I was just thinking about when you must have launched your first collection and standing in front of the entire team of Tasaki and making a presentation. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand what was the feeling inside you at that first very moment, making that first very big MD Tasaki presentation. I will tell you something, when they launched the collection in Japan, so that was this, my second trip to Japan, we had designs, they were being made, they were being launched, and they booked a gallery to do a presentation for the press. And this is, I think, one of the photographs that you used, where I have some white busts uh, and plinths at the yes. back, and then there's a big MG yes. Tasaki logo in, uh, made with the lights or something, a projection. And... Without even telling me anything, the CEO of Tasaki made a speech in Japanese presenting me, the brand, the direction behind it. And then he handed on the microphone to me. And I was just sitting before a crowd of Japanese journalists who were looking at me and expecting me to, you know, make a nice speech that was very deep and interesting. Nice. And I was just so, so nervous. And I, I don't think there was anything that would prepare me for that moment. Because if I had known what was coming, I would have been even more scared. So I said, thank you. You know, my Melanie, this is what we want to do. And then I kept it as, as short as possible. And then I handed back the <laughs> microphone. But it's those moments that define you yes. also. I have so many moments from, especially from my first trip in Japan, that I was at the crossroad, the Shibuya crossroad, which is a very famous crossroad in Ginza. That's always the, the, the photograph that you see of Tokyo people crossing this right. crossroad. Mm -hmm. And I was just standing there and I was thinking, it's like I'm in a movie now. This is not happening. You oh, know, what? Japanese brand inviting me to design for them by slicing yeah. pearls 
in Japan. It's absolutely crazy, but it's also what makes life exciting. You never know what's around the corner. Absolutely. Um, next is a question. What's the duration of time taken for a complete execution of a product? I would say a year. From the moment we I'm being sent the information about the new collection, then I send them back designs two, three months later, then they start producing prototypes, then there's usually my trip to Japan, and then we tweak details, we finalize the selection, and then by the time it's produced and being sold in stores, because what I had to realize at some point was that in Japan, when they do, when they used to do autumn, winter collections and then spring, summer, it's actually when the pieces are in the store. It's not when they're being launched to the press and then six months later they'll be in the store. So I would say more or less a year and then all the collections are in the shops and then the moment they're in the press, that means that the public can go straight away to the shops and actually look at the pieces themselves. So that means that the pieces that you designed upon exactly a year back, probably yeah, absolutely. this time, absolutely. those pieces, the pieces will be out very soon now. In absolutely. Moving forward to your new collection. Mm -hmm. And um, let's take this one last question. How do you get into selling mindset? I personally love manufacturing as an aspect, but dread the marketing of a product. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I've, I've learned to like it more. And again, this is something that I like uh, about working for myself and for a big brand, is that when you work for a big brand, you usually never meet the clients. So you're being told this amount of pieces we sold this month, or, you know, this is the kind of, this is your client more or less, you know, she's self-purchasing, et cetera, et cetera. But you never have that personal contact. And I've learned over the years, and I'm still learning this, to enjoy meeting the people who buy my jewelry because they give you feedback straight away. You know, they'll say, oh, this I don't like because it's, I don't know, yellow and yellow doesn't go with my hair. But this is all information that I can use eventually as a designer. And quite early on, I had a client in London and she, she wanted to buy a big necklace of pearls. But she told me, ah, my necklace has to be a little bit longer because it, then it makes my neck look longer. So if it's too close to the neck and you have big pearls, they make your neck look shorter, which I had, I never even knew about this. But then I learned it and it's in my brain since then. So I see the, the selling process as something which completes the design or enables you to have more information for the next design. Because ultimately these things are about proportions. You know, that's why we have long earrings, short earrings, big pearls, small pearls, and then different clients will go for different things, but you need to offer them those options. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe that uh, that every interaction with your customer is always learning because you want to have a feedback. <laughs> that's how you improve and that's how you improvise for your next collection. Yes, and you, they, they, they spontaneously give you ideas sometimes. They're like, oh, why don't you do it that color? Yes, because the common, the common pearl jewelry is white pearl, yellow gold. This is the combination that is the most successful that we see everywhere. But then the last few years, I'm starting to see a shift of people wanting baroque pearls or people wanting other kinds of pearls. They're opening up. And this comes with consumer interaction because sometimes they don't know. So at the moment where you sell them something or are present during the sale, you can exchange that information and then apply it to future pieces or future sales. And I think that's really, really important. And uh, any presence uh, in India? Well, like, is no. Are you planning? <laughs> I'm ashamed to say no. I don't know why because you, you, uh, in India, there is a, a big, big connection with pearl yes. jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very surprised, but I, I have hopes that there are plans in the future to create something in India also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and there's hope, there's life. So I'm sure that once we have hope, we will see the results very soon. Don't you think it's when you have these thoughts and you sort of let them out and then the universe hears them and then they come back and then they materialize? I'm, I'm a big believer of that. So I always like about things that I want to do in the future and then they happen in front of me like magic. So what research is done for planning a new collection or innovation in a product, how is it done? 
So research is done, I think all brands do that. So you look at who has bought your pieces, what kind of pieces they bought, which style has sold most, and then Excel sheets that break it down because you, the people who sell, they collect information, you know, how old was she? I don't know what kind of, uh, how much money did she spend on this, uh, etc. So this is all very valuable information. But for me, as a designer, because I'm not a marketing person, just mm -hmm. that, I'm not, uh, you know, I, my brain is more creative than business. <laughs> I find myself saying that. Um, I just feel there is a, a sort of energy that you pick up from looking at fashion design, architecture, looking at what people wear around you, mm -hmm. and also a personal um, need to, to find a different way of looking at pros. But a research is not like, oh, I'm going to sit down now and do research. Oh. That's ongoing in my brain, and it's being fed by information that I'm giving from Tasaki, which is very practical information on a spreadsheet but it's also my understanding of what's going on around us mm -hmm. worldwide not just in my little bubble where I live and where I work. Yes. One has to work outside the comfort zone that's where you will see the results and that's where you will see wow you know things absolutely you, you could never do it but once you step out take a leap ahead you're surprised that wow have I done this? <laughs> absolutely absolutely this is where the magic happens. And uh, between yellow gold and white gold, which is better? Pink gold. Ah! <laughs> I actually, my wedding ring, my wedding ring is in pink gold. Oh, sweet. It's, a, it's a metal that most people forget about. Exactly like the question, because I don't know why, but I think you see much less of it. And I personally find it beautiful because it just blends in. It's there, but then it's not there. It's not That's flashy. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I would say second choice, yellow gold, maybe third choice, white gold. But I'm, I'm a big, big fan of pink gold. And that's why I'm very excited when we make collections with Tasaki in pink gold and their Sakura gold. Lovely. And we're looking forward to see your next collection. And it's almost been close to one hour's time. Time has just flown by. It was really interesting to have you and to hear your wonderful insights and such an inspirational journey. I myself, I always get inspired about all the efforts and the hard work that you've done and then how mystically you're called to Japan without any intention and then boom, one thing after the other and it's been 10 beautiful years now. So that's really, really amazing and really inspiring. Thank you. And what, what I love is that it's just been 10 years. So there's more to come, hopefully, if yes. everything goes well. Yes, and who it knows will. what's going to come also. Thank you so much for having me. My you pleasure. are so lucky to be involved with so many brands and to have such a personal insight into so many brands. I'm actually very jealous because you get to <laughs> into the DNA of every brand and then go out and then go in again and then sort of immerse yourself in so many different worlds. So I find that actually absolutely <laughs> Yes, so thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much for all your thank precious you. time and for sharing your wonderful insights. And I look forward to visiting you in London or in Hamburg whenever things do get normalized, hopefully, and feel and, and hold your beautiful creations in my hand, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.